So what I'm going to do now is I'm going, I'm going to try and bring everything that we learnt together. You know, some of you might be thinking, How, what, 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 what was the path that we just went on here? They, they seem three unconnected um, subjects. Dan in the morning was like living in the future, you know, talking to us about where the world's going to go, kind of mind-blowing stuff. Marianne got back down to basics about make a list, make a handwritten list, she said at one point. Um, and Campbell's talking about change, but what change? You know, what change are we talking about? Um, for those of you that I've never, I've never spoken to before, or I've never met before, I'll give you a little bit of a brief background on myself. Um, I kind of fell out of school. Um, left with no formal qualifications and uh, no particular prospects, which, as with probably many people in the room, led me to a state agency. Um, it, it was that or, or work as a delivery driver, right? So um, I went into a state agency and probably I, wor I, I worked in one of the, poor, the poorest boroughs in East London. Um, and. The thing that I learned in a state agency quite quickly, which I wasn't aware of before I worked in it, was the ability to make money. Like, and I don't mean how to do a job and get paid, I mean literally invent money. Um, I was selling houses to developers mainly, small time developers, who were buying crappy houses and painting them magnolia and then selling them for more money. And it was like, whoa, this is weird. I just sold that guy the house for you know, at the time, 50 grand, and I've just resold it for him for 80 grand. And I, I kind of quickly cottoned on to that, uh, became a mortgage advisor so I could figure out how to get mortgages without having any money, and then went, proceeded and booked to buy loads of houses. So I've always had a connection with estate agency. I worked as an estate agent for, you know, a good few years, worked for in independents, worked for corporates. Uh, about two... 2001 was when I started my very my own business. Before that, I'd been I'd worked in IT in the city as well. I started my own business, and I, and I built businesses just really based around kind of what I'd learned in a state agency. Um, we're going to try and make some more money next, this month than we, we than we made last month, and we'll do that by I guess phoning people up and doing some advertising. I don't know. That's kind of how it works, and it sort of works. Stumbles along. Um, about 10 years into that journey, I, by, by either luck or judgment, managed to find myself in this group of entrepreneurs who had all built 100 million pound businesses. And they all spoke about business in a very similar way. You do these things, you sell the company for 100 million quid. And it just made me think, like, what the fuck have I been doing for the last 10 years? Um, these people are talking about stuff that I've never even thought about. And it, it sort of switched my brain on to this idea that you don't know what you don't know. You know, there's, there's a certain amount, I think I've got a slide in, it, in here somewhere as we go through it, there's a certain amount of knowledge that you're kind of aware of that you don't know, and there's the stuff you do know, but then there's tons of stuff that you just don't, doesn't, don't know exists. You know, there's people out there making millions of pounds from Bitcoin and not many people in the room know the first thing about it. It's probably not that complicated. I can't claim to be an expert myself, but if someone explained it to you, you'd probably be like, huh, wow, shit, why am I not doing that? So, 10 years in, I started to change the way that I worked. Uh, since then, I've built multi-million pound businesses. As I said before, I've written two best-selling books. We, for the speakers today, that'll be a reoccurring theme. We, we try to find speakers that have some credibility around that, where they've got an audience of people that like what they talk about. My first book was about marketing. The second was about how you build data-driven businesses. We built a 15 million pound business with no sales team, just using data. Um, so I know how it works. I've walked that path. Um, I'm, I'm not just talking the talk. I've been featured on Forbes as one of the entrepreneurs in the world making a difference. I've had a TV show on Sky. All of this stuff has changed since I started to have more of a strategy around how you build a business and why you do it. <clears throat> so what I want to talk to you guys about today is bringing everything together that, we, that we've spoken about. Some of the things you might think, oh, uh, one of the other speakers covered this, which is true. I'm going to try to bring all that together 
into our industry and what it actually means. <clears throat> I'm not going to bother going through the stories of these companies, but everyone's heard it a million times. Campbell mentioned Blockbuster and any event you go to, they talk about Blockbuster and Kodak and all of these companies. My point with this is that looking in hindsight, any one of us kind of feels like, how did they fuck that up? Like, it, it, it wasn't that hard to see what was happening. Like, if any of us had been in charge, we would have not let that happen. So, how did it end up happening? And then, if you look at these companies. So, just do me a favour. Put, put your hand up if any of you feel like one or some or even all of these companies are heading towards extinction. Okay, so pretty much everybody, right? Now, let's forget that we're at an estate agency conference and we're all a bit biased. And imagine we're just at a conference talking about change and businesses and businesses that need to change and out-of-date companies. And how many people do you think would put their hand up if I said, do you think that's out-of-date? Right, again... Most people. So, even we can see that this is all going to go very badly. They can see it's going to go very badly and still nobody's changing. How can that possibly happen? How, how did we get into this situation whereby these companies were the Googles of their time? They had everything. They had the marketing teams, they had the money, they had the offices. I think Blockbuster, I read somewhere, had 9,800 stores just in the US. They had, they had everything. How did they not see that coming? And how are those other companies not? Why is nobody doing anything about this? How does that happen? They're not sitting there doing nothing. They had the best talent. They must have had somebody just looking at innovation. I mean, Blockbuster even built Blockbuster Online, ripped off Netflix's code, pixel for pixel, and then they still screwed it up. So, how and why? The reason is something called incremental innovation. There's a, there's a, is that a, oh, is that a minstrel? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Yeah, there's a minstrel on the floor. How does a minstrel even get up here? I'm thinking someone must have thrown it, literally, while they were watching the movie. Anyway, incremental innovation. Um, what is incremental innovation and why do companies do it? I've got to show you some of these. They just, I, I found them while I was putting my presentation together and they just made me laugh. So this is, these are, some of these are a great example of incremental innovation. They're... they're they're changes that people make almost for the sake of it. I mean, who the fuck makes a camouflage golf ball? Seriously. What? 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 <laughs> Gone. Never find it. A, a sign. I think that's right. Um, so, incremental innovation. It, companies do it because. Of course, they always need to be moving forward. And of course, they're always being approached by companies to try to sell them new ideas. And some of those ideas sound quite good. And they think, OK, yeah, well, let's give it a go. But it's, they're small. They're small, tiny changes. They don't make any particular difference. They don't disrupt anything. They don't mean that you have to write a new manual for your staff or think of a new way of working. You just going to make a small change, you're going to put a chatbot on the website, great, you know, nothing particularly changes, so you feel like you're innovating, oh yeah, we work completely differently to the way we used to, we never used to have that chatbot. This is a great example of incremental innovation, we can go all the way back 
to what, 121 years ago, and all the changes that these razor companies have made over the years, essentially you've still got the same, the same thing. It does, it does almost an identical job to the, to the razor from 121 years ago. It hasn't really been disrupted. You know, nobody's made a machine whereby, I don't know, I, do, I, put, I put something on my face and it leaves me with a five o'clock shadow. Like, no, no one's created that. Small innovation. I mean, how many times have we seen the advert, like the Mac 5 and the Mac 5 Pro Ball and the Mac 5 this? And, the, and nothing particularly changes about it. No one says, oh, you got me, you know, the wrong razor, I'm not going to be able to shave. <clears throat> Companies do this because of all the things we spoke about today, from what Campbell was talking about, as leaders, we've, we've done things in the past, we've all experienced it, where we've, we've, we've convinced our team to make a change against their will, and it's ended up going badly. We've ended up with egg on our face in some way or another, and we've had to come back with our towels between our legs and go, okay, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't the best thing to do. Um, or, even worse than that, we can't muster the, um, the courage to do that, so we just plough on anyway with something that we also think is a bad idea. And so we kind of avoid it. We stay away from that. We stick with the low-risk stuff. Especially if the company, as Campbell said, is doing pretty well anyway. You know, we're making money. We're doing all right. Let's not screw things up. Let's not rock the apple cart. Let's, putting this little thing in isn't going to make a big difference. No one wants the whole team moaning at them, even if it is a good idea. Some examples of incremental innovation in our sector, as I said before, would be something like chatbots. Now, before I go through these, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying that any of these things are a bad idea. In fact, some of them are things that we actively promote. I'm just saying on their own, they don't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything to put a chatbot on your website. It doesn't make any difference. You could say, oh, well, it does, because you know, people like to talk to us online. And that's true. And I'm not saying you shouldn't put a chatbot on. What I'm saying is it isn't innovation. It isn't changing anything. A state agency is still a state agency with or without a chatbot on the website. Better property details. I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't do better property details. By giving me a set of property details that tells me the closest ferry port doesn't make estate agency better. Doesn't change anything. Email marketing, booking online viewings. Booking online viewings is one of the isn't a problem in estate agency. That's not a problem that needs solving. I am looking for a property at the moment and I'm having to deal with estate agents. And booking viewings isn't an issue. That's not one of the things that's badly broken. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it doesn't really make any difference. Listing on a new portal, Facebook ads, instant valuations, automated canvassing, like automatically qualifying portal leads. On their own, these things don't make any difference. Oh, that's better. Um, so they're incremental innovation. The reality of why these companies don't change and they can see the end coming and they still won't change and we can all see the end coming and we're far less qualified than the people that they've got running their organisations and they won't change is because they find it difficult. The team and the management find it difficult to adjust to a new way of working. And that's all it ever comes down to. At the bottom of everything, you can give any argument you want, at the bottom of it all, it comes down to the fact that you don't want to go through the pain of change. And that's fine. That doesn't make you wrong or right. It just means that you must accept the fact that you're going to wrap up tight and go over the edge of the roller coaster. <clears throat> what is disruptive innovation? So disruptive innovation is a company that decides we need to radically change the way that we work or we won't exist at some point in the future. And that future might be many years away. Netflix, I mean, 
A lot of you will remember, because you're a similar age to myself, some of the younger people here might not even remember that Netflix was an actual physical DVD service. You got them in the post. That's how they started their whole business. Imagine the infrastructure they needed to get that business off the ground. Sending out physical DVDs. And then it became a subscription business. Still sending DVDs. And then it became an online streaming business before you could even really properly stream video online. But they had a vision as to where they wanted to go and they pivoted the company. YouTube was a dating site. When YouTube first started, you'd up upload a video trying to sell yourself, basically. And it didn't really work. But what they found was that people did upload, upload random videos about cats and all sorts of random stuff. And it kind of caught on. <clears throat> Amazon, I think most people know Amazon's beginning. You could buy physical books online. That's it. That's where it started. At some point, they decided to truly go from A to Z and cover everything in the world. And Starbucks started out as a, a company whereby you could buy the beans and the, and the equipment and make coffee at home. And quickly they realised, oh, we'll just do it for you and charge you extortionate amounts of money for a cup of coffee. <clears throat> so that, that's real innovation. Companies that are going to tear up the rule book and go, there's a there's another way we should be doing this, and, it, and it's going to lead us to a better place. But I can't imagine any of those changes were particularly fun to go through. Why is this disruptive innovation necessary? Education is a great example. We've got this system that's been the same forever. If you look at the very high end of education, Stanford University, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, they have very limited amount of space in their university and a very, very high cost to get in. And then COVID blew into town and all of a sudden they still charge the same money but you could learn from home. So why are we having to limit the intake numbers now? Surely even if I live in the deepest, darkest parts of Africa, if I've got an internet connection, why can I not go to Cambridge or Harvard? I, who's going to disrupt that? Are they going to disrupt themselves or are they going to wait for someone else to do it? What if Google comes along and gives you the very, very best teachers and courses on the planet for a monthly subscription? Courses that will actually lead to employment with some of the best companies in the world What's going to happen then? So how long are they going to ride that gravy train for before they decide to disrupt it themselves? Amazon are about to blow the health sector to pieces. Literally, they're going to destroy it. They started years ago with the idea that they could do all of the distribution of the pharmaceuticals in the States and make it much more efficient. And everybody loved that. All the GPs loved that. And then they made a pharmaceuticals company. Now they deliver all of their own pharmaceuticals to all of the doctors in the States. And very shortly, in your Amazon Prime membership, you'll have your private medical insurance. You'll wear an Amazon health monitor and you'll see an Amazon doctor. And when he prescribes something to you, it'll arrive by one o'clock the next day. There won't be GPs. You'll all have private health insurance in your Amazon Prime membership. And they'll know whether you're a risk or not because you're wearing the thing on your wrist. Hotels, airlines, cruises, they're all in this boat. Due to COVID, it's become obvious that these industries have to innovate. Someone's going to just blow them apart. But how long are they going to continue to ride that train for? Are they going to do it themselves or are they going to let someone else do it? I love this cartoon. This this is my life, talking to people that want a whole new way of working. They love it. They, they're like, I totally get it. Brilliant. We, we just want to be able to do everything we've always done 
and with a bit of that stuff on top. It just doesn't work like that. Some of the things that you're, you were doing, you have to accept it's one or the other. Like Campbell said, it's a net positive. So when I was an agent, many years ago, when I was an agent, we had our whiteboard. This is how many viewings you've got to do in the month. This is how many valuations we want in the month. That's it. Great, let's do it. Most companies are still working that way. But why? I mean, you might go, well, what do you mean why? Of course we've got to have KPIs. Okay, but you, sell, you tell me I've got to make 50 viewings in the month and I make 25. What's your advice for me? Make more? I, I haven't got a fucking magic wand. What do you want me to do? Like, it's, I can understand, like, if the person's sitting there doing nothing. Most people in this, in this room have got a small enough organisation where you would know if someone's sitting doing nothing. So what is this KPI telling you? Wouldn't it be more beneficial to be able to see the where's Wally on the map? To be able to actually see, these are the people that need calling. Wouldn't that be more useful? So why do you need that old system? It's very hard to get your head around, especially when you're busy. Innovation fails because companies don't want to go through the pain of change. These guys with the cart, they're way too busy to stop and put round wheels on it. They've got shit to do. You know, this, not this year, last year, when the estate industry was mega busy, no one had time to do anything, and that's fair enough. Make hay while the sun shines and everything. But there comes a point where you're going to have to make time. A great, a great way of looking at that as well, someone said to me um, just this morning, I think it might have been yourself, Carol, maybe not enough hours in the day and stuff. And something. I learned once was instead of saying I didn't have enough time or there's not enough hours in the day, to just rephrase it as I've bitten off more than I can chew. Because what the brain does is it, it allows you to see that you're in control. You have bitten off more than you can chew. You can change that. You, could, you should have delegated some of that work if those things were important. Couldn't go. Couldn't go to the gym today, way too busy. But the reverse of that is a bit off more than I could chew. So I won't do that again, and then I can get the things that are important to me in there. <clears throat> so it's important to remember this, this stuff when you're going through your internal meetings, when you're sitting there talking about, we've tried to implement this and it just don't work, or we we're not sure we should go down that road. Things work okay as they are. Is it really going to be any good? Just remember that all of the internal discussions, the recommendations, no one ever talks about the primary demotivator. The primary demotivator is that nobody wants to change. That's what it comes down to. Examine what the objection is and you'll find there's not really any substance behind this. Those companies that we looked at before, WH Smiths, I mean, really, what has, ends up happening around that board table is that someone says, well, we think that there are still some people out there that want to buy a pencil and a Cadbury's cream egg once a year. Like, who gives a fuck about them? It's not going to save the company. It's not important. They're saying it because they don't want to change. They don't want to go for anything different. It's critical to see through this when you're having those discussions. And WH Smith is a brilliant example I mean, they're held up by their airport arm, which does brilliantly, so that you can't complain about. But how obvious do you need it to be to make a change? I mean, at the beginning of this, we all, most people put their hands up and can see there's a problem coming. How obvious do you need it to be? They've been voted the worst retailer for two years in a row and have been in the bottom two nine years on the trot. <laughs> how obvious do you need it to be? Their response is that the survey is neither relevant nor meaningful to their loyal customer base. What loyal customer base? Who, who the fuck goes to WH Smith? Old people. Old people. <laughs> An old person. No, I'm only joking. No, don't get me wrong, right? If I'm walking past WH Smith and I happen to need a pencil, 
maybe I would go in there, but pencils are like £5.48 in WH Smith. And it takes about four and a half hours to get served. My point is, right, there is nothing different about that WH Smith from when I was a kid, except for the fact you can't buy records in there. That's the only difference. It's exactly the same, it's never changed. None of these companies can innovate because they can't change their staff. There are too many people. There are too many Dorises working in WX Smiths that have worked there for 30 years. You're never going to get her to change unless you ripped up the roots of the company and started all over again. And that is fucking painful. Who wants to go through that? They'd rather head into oblivion. Of course they can see it's coming. We can see it's coming. Of course they can see it. Curry's PC World. Oh my God. Ah, oh, the last time. I think I might have spoken about this at Stay and CX. When I moved home in 2018, I was going to get a new TV and I made the mistake. I was over at a retail park. My wife and my daughter went into some store and I said, I'll go and look in Curry's PC World. And I looked at the tellies and there was this one there. Oh, it was reduced and it looked good. And I was like, I just, I should just take it now. What a fucking palaver that turned out to be. <laughs> I actually thought, I could order it online, but I'm here. It's got to be here. right here. Their, their computer system is like, when I was at school, we used a BBC Electron on a black screen with green writing. They're still using that. Like, it hasn't even got windows on it, their computer. They're going to die, and they know it. Once it was Curry's, now it's PC World. Now the two of them have joined together to go off into the sunset. They can't change because they can't change their staff. They can't, they, of course, the top of the tree can see what needs to happen, but it's just too big, a, big, too big a process. So when do you know if you're in trouble? You know, we've seen companies come out of the blue and just disrupt something, and it's like, whoa, we've never, never even had a chance to react. Very rarely is that the case if you look at it, if you look at it objectively. And the way that you can usually tell is how fast is your industry innovating? What sort of new innovation arrives? So if we look at our industry, and we go back 20 years. 20 years ago, we had Rightmove, and we're still using it. 20 years ago, we had Vibra, and we had Repit, and we're still using them. They've had a few updates, but they're essentially the same. We had the same sow boards 20 years ago. We had the same... Fucking window displays. Don't get me talking about window displays. They had the same window displays 20 years ago, and we still have them now. And we made the same fucking phone calls 20 years ago, and we're still making them. I haven't been an estate agent for over 26 years, and if I went back to work in one of your estate agents, I imagine I'd make the same calls that I was making 26 years ago. It's exactly the fucking same. It's like Groundhog Day. I mean, some of you guys were agents when I was an agent. Jesus, you must be like a saint. You made those same calls. I mean, obviously, you've now gone on and own businesses, so you're probably not making the calls, but you're listening to someone making the same calls. It's just crazy. Meanwhile, in those same 20 years, what else has changed? I mean, 20 years ago, you were lucky if you could get half a meg broadband speed. I didn't have half a meg broadband speed 20 years ago. I was still on a dial-up. My kids will never know that pain of going to download a song off a Napster and it popping up with a little box that says like five days to download. Right. We were, in 20 years ago, we were still 12 years away from 4G, which, you know, oh, so what, 4G? Well, 4G allows us to do all the things we do on our phone, watch a video, even load an image without having to wait a long period of time. So we were still 12 years away from that. CDs were at their peak in sales. There was no such thing as an iPhone. In fact, there was no such thing as a smartphone except for maybe, you know, a Palm Pilot or something like that, not a real, what we would consider a smartphone. 
No Instagram, no Facebook, no YouTube, no Twitter. None of this stuff existed. 20 years ago, you'd get a taxi. That's how you got places. Now people don't even use the word taxi. They literally, Uber's become a word, like an actual word in the dictionary, like just catch an Uber. We would have corded phones in our house attached to a wall. Like, you have, a, have to have a call in front of everyone in the, in the house. Now, it's like Star Trek. Literally, people are walking around, it looks like they're talking to themselves. That was a phone. My, my kids watched, there's a, there's a movie called Jumanji and a second movie. And in the second movie, they go in to rescue this boy that got trapped in a computer game in the 90s. And this girl's in there saying, like, oh man, if only I had my phone with me. And he's looking at her like, phone must mean something different <laughs> in the world now because like, what use would that be in the jungle? Like, that's a phone. That's, that's a computer. That's a, a, a supercomputer that people are carrying around in their pocket. Back then, you would actually date people. You, if I wanted to date somebody, I had to go out and meet them. Like, that's not a thing anymore. If you went out and tried to meet somebody, they'd have you arrested. <laughs> this is the best one. When I talk to my kids about this, they think I'm talking about something that happened in the war. Like, you used to go on holiday take all your photos without any idea as to whether any of them come out. I can remember me and my brother standing proudly outside, I don't know, the hotel. You get home and then you send off the, the film, wait two weeks, back comes the photos and you're that big in the distance. Brilliant. Keep that one forever. The f we'd go and see GPs if something was wrong. Now you just Google it until eventually you find out you're going to die. <laughs> and buying clothes. I can remember when people spoke about the fact that you'd be able to buy clothes online, and it was, it was, it was just dismissed. It was ridiculous. Who's going to buy clothes that you can't even try on? Now, my house, every day, the Amazon guy must be like, fucking here again. Like, it, it's like Boxing Day. Every day, our rubbish. In, in a state agency, over those 20 years of cr crazy, it's like a different world, what's changed? Right, we've got a new logo. <laughs> That's it. Nothing, nothing else has changed. I mean, all right, maybe the window displays now have got a few little lights. They've got a few lights around the picture. It's awesome. So how long will this gravy train last? Well... Remember back in March 2020, we'll all re always remember that. Everybody cried. Everybody had that moment where they were like, fuck, like the world just blew up. And there was nothing you could do. Campbell spoke about it. Everyone got to experience what it's like to have anxiety. <clears throat> well, think back a bit more than that. We also had it when these guys really hit the scene. There was a moment, a small moment, where Everyone went, shit, like, we're all in trouble now. And then they fucked it up. <laughs> but I can promise you there's a whole load of companies waiting to take a state agency to the cleaners. You might not even be able to see it, but I can promise you that there's more than just this, companies that are ready to just step in and take a state agency straight out of the equation. So how do we stop it? We've learnt some stuff from Dan, from, Mar from Marianne, from Campbell. Well, what does that actually all mean in a state agency? How does a company actually become essential in the 2020s? They use big data. And again, I know that sounds a bit like, oh, fucking data, data, data. Like, you know, we just want to sell and let some houses. So let's dig into what that actually looks like. Big data, forget the, forget the wording. It allows you to create the personal service. If any of you have ever seen any of my posts on social media, you'll know that they immediately get hijacked by people saying, it's not all about data, you know. We like to give a personal service. You can't give a personal service. 
you don't have enough time in the day with the systems you've got. When I was targeted to make 100 viewings a month, I haven't got time for a personal service. I'm just randomly phoning people that don't want to be phoned, hoping to find some gold somewhere. The same when I call through my old valuations. Had any further thoughts about it? No. Oh, uh, anything else you want to talk about? No. Right, next. That's well personal, that is. It's not a personal service at the moment. Data allows you to give a personal service because like Dan said, who's more likely to be able to recommend a great book to you? Your friend that you've known for 15 years or a complete stranger? You get the data, you get the information. I can see what you've been reading. I know you were active recently. I know that you just read an article about the three next steps of putting your house on the market. That allows me to phone that person and go, hi, I just thought I'd touch base with you. Have you had any further thoughts? Oh, yeah, actually, we are thinking about it. <laughs> what a fucking coincidence. I only need to phone a few people. So, but to do it, you have to take a big step back. Because if at the same time you're going, and don't forget to also make 100 viewings today, I haven't got time to, I haven't got time to look at the more intrinsic data of like who's been looking at what. A quote from Google, to stay viable and thrive basically in today's world, Businesses need to be good at anticipating what's next and reacting in real time. So how do you do that? You've got some systems, tick. You know what you're doing, tick. We've got, you've got data, you've got names, email addresses, you've got an instant valuation tool set up. Yeah, got all that. Got registrations, great. Great. How are your systems letting you predict what happens next? It wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing in the 90s. It wasn't a thing in the noughties. You, you haven't got a system that lets you do that. These guys are amazing at it. They know what you're going to do before you know, certainly before your spouse knows. <laughs> they know everything about you. And they can sell stuff to you, and they can't be replaced. Amazon is a great example. How many times do you go on Amazon to buy one thing and end up spending like 100 quid because they know other stuff you want? All these teams on the right, they're all data companies. Going back to what Dan spoke about. All of them. And there's millions more as well. They're all data companies that can predict what you want next before you even know you want it. And all of those companies over there on the left are transactional. They're waiting for somebody to come to the till. And when they do, we'll process the sale. So if I fancy going to Boots to buy something, they're there for me. And if I don't, that's the end of it. But if we look across at these companies, McDonald's and Coca-Cola are the most interesting, I think, to this old, our audience because, yeah, okay, well, we can understand that Google and Amazon and Apple are massive technology companies. Of course, they've got data. But how do you relate that to a small estate agency? But McDonald's, Coca-Cola, right, they know they need to be data businesses. Do you think it's a coincidence that McDonald's put those self-serve screens in? Do you think it's a coincidence that you could skip the queue now and do it via an app? The app that's in your phone that tells them who you are and where you live and where, what restaurant you're ordering from, and what day you order the food, and what food you order, and when you're most likely to want to order again. That's not a coincidence. They're becoming a data company. And when they get that data, those guys are finished. Because they'll advertise to you just before it's McDonald's time. Coca-Cola spent decades trying to create new drinks that people might like. Who remembers? like vanilla Coke and things like that, flops. How could they be able to predict what drinks people want? Well, I guess they could make a machine where you mix it yourself, that's got machine learning inside of it, that says, huh, everybody, how weird is this? Everybody makes cherry Sprite. Is that even a thing? Yeah, they do. They've just released it in America because they know from the machines that's what everybody wants, and the sales went through the roof. And now you can go to those machines and you can download the app, you can make the mix yourself, save it as your favourite, and just scan and pay, and out comes the drink. Why? Because they know who you are. 
and what you order, and they can tie it all together. And now they're a data company. Tesla's got 20 cameras inside the car and outside the car so it can drive itself. They know what you're wearing. They know what you're talking about, where you drive to, when you drive there, whether you're having an affair. They know, it all. They know everything. And of course, all of these other companies, Netflix, Netflix, I mean Netflix, Netflix know whether you've got kids, <laughs> they know where, what type of movies you like to watch, when you watch them, when you have your downtime, when's the best time to show you adverts if they needed to. Amazon, of course, you know, Amazon know who lives in your household, whether you've got a baby, whether you've got young children, whether you're old, whether you go on holiday a lot, when you're going on holiday, you can have a ring doorbell if you want so they can even see who comes in and out of your house. This was what I was talking about at the beginning. I think it's fair enough, from my own experience, to say I just didn't know until I did know. And once I knew, then it was up to me to make the change. And we, we don't know most things. Some of that stuff maybe even that I just spoke about there, about machine learning. Maybe people didn't know that stuff. <clears throat> so it's fair enough. Sometimes you just don't know. And if you don't know, you don't know. But what about when you do know? What about when you do know that you've been in the nine, nine years in a row, one of the worst two retailers in the country, and you do nothing about it? That's negligent, surely, right? Why? Why do nothing about it? You know. You're just going to head to oblivion. So for instance, You, did you, do you know that in life cycle, in your industry, the system will tell you where Wally is? Like it tells you who to call for viewings. It tells you who to call for market appraisals. And it tells you who to call for instructions. And there are agents in this room you, that use it and do that. So why? Would you want to call a hundred random people to try and find the seven? You, you know now, right? The life cycle does that. It does that right now. There are people in this room. In fact, I can see a couple that I remember speaking to about it recently, whereby the system said, call this person. They phoned them. They viewed it. They paid 40 grand over the asking price. Right. One call. Straight with the circle round Wally on the map. And the argument against that, <coughs> the only one that I've really heard, there might be others, when we get to question time, I guess, um, is, yeah, but what you're missing there, Mark, is that there's other opportunities in those 100. You know, if I don't speak to all 100, how do I know if they've got houses to sell? Some of them might need a mortgage. Some of them might need that. And this whole imaginary personal service thing that we do. If we call them all, We'll find other leads. I'm not against that. I'm not against making phone calls, but the computer already figures that out for you. It's already mined all the data. The computer's registering them. They don't, the computer doesn't skip questions. It doesn't not ask them about their mortgage because they were in a hurry. It asks them every time. They fill it out. The data shows us. The computer registers people way better than a person can. That doesn't mean that people are not useful. You can empower your people and say, I don't need you doing that crap anymore. I don't need you just f phoning 100 people at random, trying to register them. You're better than that. The system does it. They don't register themselves. We're all used to that world now. Register yourself, fill the details out. And now the system will tell me who to call that's got a house to sell not yet on the market. Who's got a house that's on the market with another agent? Who needs a mortgage? Who hasn't sorted their solicitors? Who's a first time buyer? Who's a landlord? Who's gonna rent their house out? It's all in there. It just tells you. So why, why are we gonna just continue now? We've gotta make 100, 100, 100 market appraisals this month, like get on the phones. Can do, but this is happening right now. This isn't, Dan said, oh, you know, this might come along in a few years' time. This is happening right now. There are agents in this room that work this way right now. So now what are you going to do? Just carry on? 
All of these companies have the same problem. I don't need them. They haven't got anything valuable that's exclusive to them. I go to Boots to buy other people's products. Same with WH Smith's. Well, House of Fraser don't even exist anymore. Curry's PC World. If Curry's PC World were to do a deal with Apple, where they were the exclusive seller of the new iPhone or MacBook, they'd have a queue around the fucking corner, just like the Apple Store does. They've got nothing of their own. No reason in the world for me to go there. Same with Tui, same with Argos, same with estate agents. For as long as estate agents continue to use other companies to sell their properties, I don't need the estate agent. Now you can talk about convenience, you can talk about people don't want to do it themselves, I can guide them through the process, it's a complicated process, the conveyancing, the this, the, the, the negotiation, yep, totally get it. But what happens when someone in the Philippines says they'll do all of that for a fiver? Well, yeah, I can't. Can't they? I mean, we're about to see GPs go online. You can't even go to see your GP. It's very hard. That could be about a life-threatening illness, not about selling a fucking house. You know what the price of the house is. You know how much it's valued at. Uh, just yesterday at the EA Masters, a lot of you were at the EA Masters. Michelle Gallagher won, best estate agent in the UK. She does all her valuations on Zoom, so don't tell me it can't be done. I did a podcast with her about it on, on Estate Agency X. Have a listen to it. She has more business now than when she used to do those valuations in person. So you, disruption is coming, and estate agents have nothing of their own. You can go to a new portal if you want. Great, let's make them really popular. We can sell houses on Facebook, because you know all the agents around here are dinosaurs, and we sell houses on Facebook. Brilliant, so what? I mean, so what are you saying? That I should just put my house on Facebook? No, no, because we've got, you know, we've got... I saw an agent just the other day who said, no, but we've got 8,000 followers. We've worked really hard to get that up. Our competition haven't got any. I said, all right, and what about when they've got 20,000 followers? I went, well, that's going to take them ages. I said, I can get them 20,000 followers tomorrow. You can buy followers, run ads, or buy other means. It's not that hard. So what, then your USP is gone? Oh, well... They said, you know what they said? Don't tell them. <laughs> Brilliant. What if it was your database that the public wanted to register into? What if they could set up their search profiles directly into your database themselves? They could edit their profiles to get alerts about properties before they go anywhere else. They're learning about them from you. Not from Rightmove, not from Booming, not from On The Market, not from Zoopla, not from Facebook, from you. What if it works something like this? Ever missed out on the perfect property just because you heard about it too late? Or the estate agent never told you about it as it was slightly outside of your criteria? Never miss out again by using our Heads Up Property Alerts. Simply create your profile, and our system will constantly give you the heads up on suggested properties and price reductions that might specifically interest you, and the percentage by which they match against what you are looking for before they even hit the property portals. You can update, refine, or unsubscribe at any time. So try it for yourself, and be the first to get the heads up on properties you might like. Heads up property alerts, a smarter way to find a property. So if I'm seriously looking for a property in your area, especially right now, because properties are thin on the ground, I'm going to register. If I'm not that serious, I might give it a miss. But if I'm serious and I see that advert, I'm going to register. And then all of a sudden, what happens? I'll tell you what happens, because it's happening right now. We're seeing it, and there's agents in here that will tell you about it in a minute. I've got agents to talk about it themselves, because I'm biased, right? So. If that happened, people would be registering with you before they register with any other agent. Because it's not really a thing anymore. I'm not saying it never happens, but I don't just decide to go around registering with agents anymore. I just sit and wait for properties to come up on right move, and then I inquire about properties, and you register me anyway, even though I never asked to be. But you go through that process, right? You have to qualify me. So this way, you're learning about people before before any of the other agents even know those people exist. 
and the system's registering them fully. We're doing the where's Wally thing now, right? So therefore, you have the buyers and the tenants, not the portals, you have them. No other agent has them, you. You have a ready-made list of people that have properties to sell or let. No one else has got that list yet. No one else even knows they're looking. You've got a ready-made list of people that need a mortgage. You've got a ready-made list of people that need a solicitor. You've got a ready-made list of people that are either investors or about to become investors. And this lists, these lists update every day on their own while you're asleep. You come into work and there's new people that have got houses to sell that have registered overnight. And new people that are looking to buy for investment. And new people that need mortgages. Agents are doing this right now. This isn't a, an imaginary future we're looking at. They're doing it right now. So what, why, why would you not do that? The only reason is it's just too much hassle. Oh, we still need to pull off that report. Like Campbell said, it's net positive. Do you really need that report? Really? Because I was talking to an agent the other day and they said to me, Come on, I can't work unless I have a report that tells me how many, whatever it was, viewings this person has done. And I said, it's, it's, just a, it's just the way you're looking at it. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I live in a world where I can't work without a system that tells me who to call for viewings. That would be more important to me. I'd rather have the system that tells me who to call for viewings than a system that tells me how many viewings this guy's made. He sits next to me. I ain't working in a 5,000 people company. He's on the, he sits next to me every day. Who, who to call for valuations? I can tell you right now, I've been into our agents' databases. There are loads of opportunity for valuations. I'm not saying all those people are ready to go now versus somebody that's sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know, get some, let's get some letters out, I guess. <clears throat> so as I said, I'm biased, right? I am going to say this. You can sit there and go, yeah, 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 whatever. So what about if the agents actually told you? The agents who actually used it, they also told you that it worked. Uh, so running a business through Lifecycle and running an estate agency through Dupix are worlds apart. There's, Dupix is very one-dimensional in the sense that you, you are governed by a way of working and you can only work in, in one way and it, it only covers a, a small part of what we do as estate agents. Just calling out, I think that's one of the key areas that I found is it saved a lot of time is you could actually concentrate on quality rather than going through every single person. It saves us a lot of time. The mundane tasks of certain phone calls which now we just don't need to make anymore. The fact that it, for us, I was looking at two or three different software packages, MailChimp, I was looking um, to do one side of the thing, I was looking for another software package to do this, I was looking for another software package to do that, and we had them all and it was expensive as hell. Uh, now this does it all. Lifecycle can tell us rather than sifting through dozens and dozens of people to see if they're still looking, we can see at a glance who's actually active um, on the system, and therefore that saves us a lot of time and effort making loads of phone calls which are just dead time. Um, in terms of gaining us listings, again, we can see who is active on our system. So we may have done a valuation six months ago, and then suddenly, recently, they've been all over our website. We can see them looking at our staff, we can see them looking at our properties, we can see them looking at our Google reviews, and we think, right, these people obviously are now at a stage where they're thinking about moving. There's a potential viewings tab. So again, we know the people that are actually looking at their property, they're your direct call, and we've again, we found recently with, with one, which is one of our biggest um, success stories with a buyer, um, literally within us, click of a button um, on life cycle, we called the first potential viewing, it resulted in a 40k uh, over the asking price offer. How does running an agency on Dupix compare to running it on life cycle? Probably the biggest thing is how we've been able to streamline processes. Um, Lifecycle automates an awful lot of things that we had a person doing. And the person probably could still do that, to be fair. But 
the way life cycle works, it gives us more time to work on more productive things. It, if rather than ring 100 landlords or 100 vendors, it tells us the 10 to ring, and that makes us more productive. The difference between running my agency and my business through Repit and what it's like through Lifecycle is worlds apart. Yeah, I think for me, the, the, the kind of thought when I was going to move on to Lifecycle as to what it could do to actually now what I can see that it can do and where we were back then, kind of goes back to what I was saying. It's like having a, you know, an old filing cabinet in the corner room with the lights off and you're kind of going around, don't really know what you're doing. Suddenly someone turns the lights on and goes, you know, here's the Ferrari and you're like, right, I'm away. So rather than having a list of random people, you've got a list of people that want to be called or you, you hope they want to be called and spoken to about that relevant subject, whether it be putting their property on the market for sales or lettings, viewing a property for, for, for sales or for lettings. Um, it, does, it does a lot of the work for you. But the main thing for me was that the shift in my mindset of where my business was going, Vibra really couldn't support, you know, up to the year 2000, um, Vibra was okay, a bit clunky, but okay. But there was nothing else that was really about that could challenge it or take over so he was in that dilemma of devil I know devil I don't all right we'll put up with it and then you know shift in terms of how we operate life cycle came along and boom you know it's it's not even a comparison to, to, to say you're switching from one CRM to another yeah life cycles a CRM but it's so much more so Life cycle is not a magic wand. It's not a wow. That sounds. But that's. I mean, that sounds fucking amazing, to be honest. Um, but um, it's not a magic wand. You you don't put life cycle in and go like right. We're a data driven business. We're doing what Daniel Priestley said. It's hard. That's why I had these speakers here today. There's a process of change. Your staff have to come on the journey. Remember what Dan was saying about if you don't let them see the rabbit, you just look like a mental fox. So they're going to see the rabbit. We can support people with it. We ask the team to qualify themselves, do a life cycle academy. But will they? Won't they? Maybe. Like, there's a whole process of change that takes place if you decide you want to go down that road. We are handing out our arm and going, we've, we've done it. We've built the software. I've walked the walk. I've built a data-driven business worth millions and millions and millions of pounds. I've, I've actually walked the walk. I've gone from a traditional transactional business to a data-driven one. And we can show you how to do it. We even use the software ourselves. I mean, my CTO sent me a, a document from Rex the other day, who are another CRM provider. They're using HubSpot. I was like, you don't even use your own fucking software. What sort of, what sort of software business is that? We use our own software. I'm not just doing a pitch. This is out of this world, but it doesn't do what you used to do or what you've been doing for the last 20 years. It doesn't do all that stuff. You have to question as to whether, do I need it? Yes or no? Am I doing it because I've always done it or do I need it? If I need it and it doesn't do it, is there a way of me doing it outside of that system or am I just gonna stop doing it? But the stuff that this system does, there isn't a way of doing that outside the system. There isn't a way of knowing who to call for valuations and mortgages. You need to become essential. If you want to survive, you need the data. You need to become essential. I want to go to a vendor's house, and the first thing I want to say to them is, we can save ourselves a lot of time. If I can show you how only I can sell your house for the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time, with the least amount of stress, and I can categorically show you how only I can do it, will you give me 2% or will you start messing me about? If you give me 2%, if I can show you that, we can carry on the conversation. And if you won't, just go talk to someone else. And then I want to go into the system, which agents are doing right now, right? this isn't make-believe, and put in that person's actual address and say, oh look, I've got X amount of buyers looking within a quarter of a mile of this exact location, and then I'm gonna go four bedroom houses, detached. Oh look, I've got 78 people looking for a four bed detached house in this exact location, and then I'm gonna put in the price range, 
600 to 700,000. Oh look, I've got 23 people that have only registered with me because we have a sophisticated software that people register in before, to find properties before they hit the portals. So they're not registering with anyone else. These people are only registered with me. I'm the only one who knows these people. I've got 23 people looking for this house with this many bedrooms in this location for the price you want. And let's narrow it down to people that have already got an agreement in principle, 11. So we've got 11 people with an agreement in principle or nothing to sell that are looking for a four bed house in this location with the price that you want. Why would you not want me to send those 11 people first? Because if you put it on right move, the countdown's on. If we've screwed the price up, the whole world's going to know about it. Your neighbours, your family, everybody. And your only option then is to start dropping the price. Why don't we tell these 11 people first? And let's see what happens. Because if the price is right, we should sell it. If the price is wrong, well, I've got a system that will also allow me to find people through social media. So we can try that route. And then as a last result, when we feel like if we did screw any of that up, we can go to right move and start getting all the property tourists around your house. That's happening right now. Working this way requires a lot of focus. You don't just say, right, I've seen an advert, life cycle looks good, I'm using Jupix, let's switch over. It, it'll be a world of pain if you did that. This is, we're gonna, we're gonna change. We're going to change the way we work and our whole, our whole organisation is going to be aware of the fact that we're making this change and why we're making this change. Letting the computer figure out who to call is hard to do. I mean, it was talking to someone just before, Toby, who joined us last year, came from an organisation that were very into cold calling and that, that whole environment. It's kind of like a trader desk environment. And when he joined us in sales, he was like, right, I'm going to... I'm going to call some people, I'm going to make some sales. I was like, no, you, we don't do that. He's like, well, how am I going to make some sales? It's like, you're not going to make any sales. You're going to have a look who's interested in our product, because our system tells you, and then you're going to send them something more useful. So when you, we can see that they've been looking at how do I make the switch between Jupix and Lifecycle, you're then going to make contact with them and say, I don't know if you've ever heard of Lifecycle, this is what we're doing at the moment. If they don't reply or they say, I'm not interested at the moment, that's fine. We'll send them another guide to look at. Remember that stuff that Dan spoke about, 7-11-4. You're all familiar with it. That's why you're here. So it's hard when the pressure's on, when listings drop, it's hard not to just go, fuck all of that, send out some leaflets. We've been doing that for 20, 25 years. It doesn't work. Oh no, but targeted letters work. No, they don't. Tell me one business, one really, really successful business that operates that way, that sends letters. There isn't one. I can tell you fucking hundreds that run data-driven businesses. Tell me one, one business that sends, <laughs> oh fucking hell, that sends letters. We don't even have to talk about this, do we really? Sorry? HMRC, yeah. yeah. People love them. Actually, you know what? If you're going to send letters, send it in a brown envelope. It's definitely getting opened. Right. So, it's not that... All right, let me rewind on that. Because some people will say, no, no, we've had some success with that. It's not worth it. Add up the numbers. £500 a month on sending out letters to get one shitty vendor where someone else couldn't sell his house because he overpriced it, isn't worth it. Put 500 pound a month into something else. <clears throat> so that's hard. It's really hard to let the computer guide you. But it's efficient. As I say, I'm talking from a, from the, from a point of view of, of having done this. So, all you've got to do is look around. The whole world works this way. They know what their customers want before they even know they're their customers. Like I said before, you go onto Amazon, wow, it, f it predicts the things that you might want to buy. You go onto Netflix, it predicts the TV shows you might want to watch. Your system can predict the properties that people might like and then just tell you who's been looking at them. Isn't that easier? 
No, because it doesn't do a report that I needed 20 years ago. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is are you in this group of companies whereby you're just, you, you can't change? And that doesn't make you wrong. I know I'm standing up here and, you know, if you're, if you're in that group, you might find it offensive, but there's nothing wrong with being in that group of people. Like I say, you just have to accept like, no, 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 we're, we're good as we are. Fine. So you just have to figure out if you can't, don't want to go through the change because it's too painful for whatever reason, there might be a genuine reason, then just accept it. But only you can answer that. No one else can tell you. Dan can talk up here and tell you what's going to happen. I can stand up here and tell you what's going to happen. Only you can take that information and decide how, how much pain you want to experience. <laughs>